The Hyundai Kona Electric is very much like my smartphone. It's been replaced by newer, fancier models from the manufacturer. And of course, there's plenty of alternatives out there on the market. But just because my phone is a little bit older doesn't make it irrelevant in today's market. Now, the same could be said about the 2021 Kona Electric, which starts from roughly £29,000 in the UK. And if you go for the larger 64 kilowatt hour battery pack, it can be found for roughly £35,000. Now, indeed, the Kona Electric is available in two battery pack models, a 39 and 64 kilowatt hour sizes. And here what you'll find is that the former gets around 180 miles while the latter gets 300 miles on the WLTP cycle. Now in our own mixed driving test, we netted 240 to 260 miles, which is certainly impressive, although all not that surprising. The reason we say that is because the previous Kona Electric, the non-facelift model, achieved the same score and likewise did the Kia e Niro and the Kia Soul EV. Now, something worth bearing in mind is that we use the normal driving mode with the climate controls enabled and also go on the motorway, country roads, and also with an inner city commute to attain our figure. So therefore you might get lower or higher depending on how or where you drive. Now, another very important factor is the fact that we have a heat pump installed in the Kona Electric. And the reason this is of importance is because this used to be included as standard in the higher trim levels, but alas, that's no longer the case. And as a result means that you'll have to shell out around 900 pounds. So something you might want to consider if you live, for example, in the UK, or potentially might be of somewhat redundant to you if you live, for example, in the US. Now, something that we would like to also highlight is the fact that the Hyundai Group have removed the functionalities and customization of the regenerative braking levels. Now, you still have the flappy paddles found behind the steering wheel, whereby you can adjust between zero, level one, level two, and level three. And also, you have the ability to enable smart recuperation via the infotainment system, which is quite handy and therefore automatically tries to figure out how it should decelerate the vehicle. However, we do find it quite cumbersome the fact that when we change driving modes the last preset mode is not saved this used to be able to be selected via the infotainment system and now that's been taken away altogether via the later firmware updates we can only presume and as a result right now if we were to go on to drive mode and let's say just drive a couple of meters and then go on to stop go on to drive modes and switch to sport switch back to eco and then go to normal mode which we were previously on you can see now the regenerative braking level has gone to level one whereas before we had it on level three not sure why the hyundai group have chosen to remove that very useful function meaning that you don't have to faff around with the regenerative braking levels each time you step inside but nevertheless that's the case now elsewhere we're just going to go forwards a little bit and bring the car to a complete standstill now we've lift off from the accelerator pedal and if we hold down on the left flappy paddle you can bring the car to a complete standstill. That is a good inclusion, but yet again, in comparison to what else you can find out there, specifically from the Hyundai group, whereby you have got the ability to have a true one pedal driving approach, well, that's not quite the case. You'll have to resort to using the flappy paddle each time you want to come to a complete standstill, or of course, press on the regular or traditional brake pedal. They also call it one paddle driving mode which i find absolutely ridiculous but one paddle driving mode is effectively one pedal driving mode but of course you having to press on that pedal or paddle shall i say each time you want to come to a complete standstill now of course if you want to retain energy you can plug it in and here there's a type 2 and ccs port found towards the front of the vehicle the latter supports up to 77 kilowatts of input charge and therefore means that if you find an appropriate charger you can go from 10 to 80 percent in just mere 40 seven minutes if you find a 50 kilowatt charger instead it'll take roughly one hour on the larger battery pack model as for a wall box if you find it at home or at a workplace the 7.2 kilowatt input will take roughly nine hours in terms of the larger battery pack model and six hours on the smaller battery pack variant as for a three pin socket it'll take 28 hours and 17 hours respectively so what about when it comes to its performance well here the kona electric houses a front mounted motor and it displays Matches 150 kilowatts of power that equates to 201 horsepower and it gives you 395 newton meters of readily available torque. We had it tested from 0 to 60 miles an hour using RaceLogic's V-Box Sport at 6.91 seconds, which is certainly impressive, although yet again not that surprising given our previous experience of the Kona Electric and among a few of Hyundai Group's other vehicles of its class. 
Now there's a few things that we'd like to highlight given the expansive list of EVs that we've tested on the site already. And that is first off in terms of the driver's feel. It's not quite there. Even in terms of its sport mode preset, which you can select via the button found towards the center console, you'll find that even though it stiffens up the steering wheel and gives you a bit more of a responsive accelerator pedal, it doesn't give you that one-to-one -one driver's input, let's, let's say in comparison to the BMW iX3. But I understand that is a vehicle that's a lot more expensive and a completely different type of breed of SUV, so I suspect that'll be a non-issue. Now, while its raw driver's input might not be of importance to a lot of individuals, there are some other factors that you might want to consider. And here, the Kona Electric operates on a front-wheel drive system, and as a result means that if you're putting your foot down to the metal, you might notice a bit of wheel spin, or indeed a bit of slip. And this occurs both on wet and dry tarmac, and as such, you might want to tether the accelerator pedal instead. Now, elsewhere, you do also have the suspension system system, which we feel has got a good blend between having that sort of soft feel when you're driving in and around the city and therefore absorbing potholes, anomalies on the road, or indeed speed bumps, and equally holding its own when you're going around country roads and therefore inducing minimal body roll. It's not exactly the best in class in comparison to, for example, the Audi e-tron, which will have floaty-like suspension, and equally it's not as responsive in terms of its body roll in comparison to, like, say, the BMW iX3, but for a vehicle of its class and indeed in terms of its price, it is certainly impressive. So this perfectly leads us onto cabin noise, and here the Kona Electric is actually pretty well insulated from the world around. While you will hear a bit of tyre noise creeping in at higher speeds and a bit of rattle coming from the door frames when you're traversing uneven terrain, we still think it's pretty good. Now, if you want a detailed breakdown of all of this, do check out our dedicated written audio review down in the description below or indeed in the pinned comments. Now, if you want a little bit of a demo of the audio system that comes comprised as standard, which is made by Krell in the Hyundai Kona Electric, Electric, do check out our dedicated audio review on YouTube that can be found on your pop-up banner. Now here you'll get a little bit of a taster of how it sounds, but what we'll say in a nutshell and subjectively is that it is quite punchy and fun to listen to. And while it doesn't excel throughout the frequency range, it certainly will suffice for a lot of consumers. Now moving swiftly on, we get onto the use of technology within the cabin. And here Hyundai have used a 10.25 inch center weighted display. It's slightly a shame not to see it angled towards the driver, but nevertheless due to the menu system being very intuitively laid out and responsive and the use of physical buttons just found below it, it makes it very intuitive to use on the go. Now on that note, you do also have physical buttons found just below it, which are always a welcome sight. Now Android Auto and Apple CarPlay are both supported in a wired format, unless at the time of filming wireless support is not there. Now on that note we should mention that Android Auto only uses two thirds of the screen, something that we'd previously noted on the Kona Electric in terms of the 2020 model and also the other vehicles from the Hyundai Group and that also includes vehicles from Kia. It's a shame not to see a full optimization of the screen and it's quite baffling to see that even in this day and age that the Hyundai Group haven't optimized it. The same could be said about the navigation data that is fed through let's say Google Maps to your instrument cluster or in our case let's say in the ultimate stream via the head-up display. Here this navigation data isn't fed through but of course if you're using the built-in navigation you will see this data. Now on the note of the instrument cluster it's moved up to a 10.25 inch fully digitalized display. It's very vivid and also semi-customizable. As for the head-up display it does prop up and might look a little bit ugly to some but we do do think it's a fantastic inclusion and it gives you a little bit of insight as to let's say your overall speed or the safety systems that are being used and as such means that you can keep your eyes planted on the road rather than having to glance down towards the instrument cluster or indeed the infotainment system. Now should you wish to connect up your smartphone to the infotainment system you'll want to use the USB type A port found towards the front of the center console. This will allow you access to Android Auto or Apple CarPlay for example. If you just want to simply charge it there is a wireless charging pad that can be found on the premium trims or above in the same location. This can also be concealed if you want to hide your smartphone when you're away from your vehicle from prying eyes. Now below this center console unit, you'll also find another type A port, although this is used for charging only, and similarly, you've got a 12 volt socket. Now the 12 volt socket can be quite handy to power, let's say a dash cam, and if you want a roundup of our favorites, do check it out down in the description below. 
Now similarly here, if you want a power bank, you might want to look into some alternatives or suggestions for those people who are sat at the back because there's no USB ports or indeed a 12 volt socket at the rear of the cabin, which is quite a shame. And as a result might make it a little bit more cumbersome on those longer excursions that you're having with let's say family or friends. So with that in mind, it brings us on to storage within the cabin. And here you've got the glove compartment and then the front door bins, which are large enough for a 500 milliliter bottle to be sat along a medium to small size purse or wallet. And then the rear two are unsurprisingly a little bit more limited. Thankfully in the center console area, you have got the armrest area, which is pretty large, a small little key fob slash loose change place, and then two cup holders. And below the center console unit, you do have a open area as well, which can be quite handy for certain valuables, although just bear in mind that it will be in plain sight for all prying eyes. Now one complaint we've got about the storage within the cabin is that most of these places that we've mentioned don't have a non-slip sort of material or a fabric lining and as a result means that if you've got let's say some loose change place towards your door bins you're going to hear that rattling and moving around when you're driving which is quite annoying and therefore detracts from the otherwise serene in-cabin experience. Now of course when it comes to storage we have to talk about its boot capacity and it is a little bit small. You've got 332 litres and if you prop down the seats you've got 1104 litres. That's smaller than a lot of its competitors. Elsewhere you've got a 60-40 split only which is slightly a shame and therefore you don't have an integrated ski latch. Nevertheless we really like the fact that the tailgate has got a hatchback design and the fact that when you do prop down the seats you've got a flat loading bay and better still you've got an underfloor compartment storage to place a few goods including your charging cables. Now given its compact form factor it's no surprise to learn that both headroom and legroom are limited at the rear of the cabin. As someone who's just under six foot I can't really extend my legs and due to the positioning of the seats I feel that my quad muscles will become a bit tired over time. Thankfully due to the near flat rear footwell design it means that I can extend my legs making it a little bit more comfortable. Now of course if you're not using the rear middle seat you'll reveal a little area over here with two cup holders and of course can serve as a armrest. Now as for headroom, Hyundai have tried to curve the top end of the roof which is certainly appreciated for someone who's six foot or let's say if you're six foot two but if you're anything taller than that you might feel a little bit hemmed in and or will have to slouch. Now at the front of the cabin there's no such issue whatsoever both in terms of headroom and legroom and given the fact that you have got adjustable seats on the SE Connect it's no problems. If you want the electronically adjustable seats you'll have to go for the premium trim and this will also add heated front seats and a heated steering wheel. Now now in the ultimate trim you get heated and ventilated front seats and heated rear outer seats and the best inclusion in our opinion in this trim level at least when it comes to comfort is the fact that you have got a sunroof which brings in a lot of additional light and it's certainly appreciated for those people like ourselves that live in the UK. This brings us on to its exterior design where subjectively we think the 2021 facelift Kona Electric is a step above its predecessor and that's thanks to the use of body coloured wheel arches and side skirts that give it a bit more of a uniform design. Indeed at the front you've still got that futuristic type of look thanks to the headlights and as for the rear it's still got that familiar feel. As for its side profile you've got 17 inch alloys that come fitted as standard and in terms of its colour options the one pictured is what you'll get but of course if you want to customise that that, you can splash out some additional cash and change the color. And so finally we get onto safety and visibility and first off on the former it did excellent on Euro NCAP's rigorous crash test back in 2019 and the rating is still valid in 2022 which is definitely great to see. Now in terms of visibility I had no problems whatsoever at the front side or at the rear of the cabin particularly like the way that the A pillar is designed meaning it's quite easy to peer around corners when you're going around roundabouts. Now in terms of parking you do have rear parking sensors and a rear view camera that gets fitted on every trim level. Now on the premium level models or indeed the ultimate trim that we have on review you also have got front parking sensors which also takes away the stress when it comes to doing a parking maneuver. As for your driver assistance systems you've got forward collision warning and avoidance, lane follow, lane keep assist and adaptive cruise control with stop and go technology all of which are fitted as standard on all trim levels, which is absolutely fantastic to see. Now the premium trims add blind spot monitoring system, rear cross traffic alert and speed warning, while the ultimate trim adds an extra degree of 
autonomous driving whereby it incorporates highway drive assist and that effectively gives you some steering assist when you're driving on the motorway. So with all of that in mind it brings me on to my verdict and in big news review I referenced my smartphone which is the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus. Now there's certain features I don't quite like about it but I can still thoroughly recommend it even in today's competitive market. Now the same could be said about the 2021 facelift Kona Electric which offers a premium interior and exterior design has got that compact SUV form factor and furthermore goes the distance at least in the 64 kilowatt hour battery pack model as such it gets our best buy award now i've been treated to hear your thoughts of the vehicle down in the comments section below and if you've liked this independent detailed review definitely do drop a like subscribe and hit that bell notification it definitely does help and if you've done that already we just want to thank you in advance as such i've been chris from toasted ev and i hopefully see you in the next one take care of yourselves and goodbye